In this episode of Redefine, we talk with the very funny Paula Poundstone, one of the top 100 comedians of all time. Paula joins us from her home in Los Angeles to share why being a stand-up comic is pretty much the same as being any other creative. You can get exhausted looking at your competition instead of focusing on your own work. Paula also shares why after her diagnosis of OCD, she realized it was nearly impossible to corral her own self which led straight to her very successful and wildly unique creative style. You're watching Redefine with Tamara Lackey, presented by Adorama TV. Thank you, Paula, for joining us today on Redefine. Well, thanks so much for having me. I would love to talk to you about like 8 million things, having seen so much of your stand-up and uh, wait, wait, don't tell me. Um, just like brilliant, stable pieces of society. But uh, I want to start out just right out of the gate talking about the fact that you have been doing stand-up since you were 19, correct? Correct. Okay, so what is the, uh, the magic recipe to uh, sustaining um, such fresh creativity? Go, all you. Part of it is probably just loving doing it. Um, and I really, really do. Uh, and what's not to love, after all. But, um, I, you know, the way I work is... is kind of very organic. Uh, I, um, I have jokes and they're largely autobiographical in nature and I happen to be a person who I try anyways to keep up with what's going on in the world. So there's a certain uh, you know stream of that that goes through. But the other thing is my favorite part of, uh, uh, of the night is I talk to the audience. I do the time honored where are you from? What do you do for a living? And uh, in this way little biographies kind of emerge. And yeah. I weave everything yeah. through that. And so it, by its very nature, every night is, is different. And every night is not, um, it's not like you'll never hear a joke. You, you know, if you came one night and came on another night, well, you might hear some things repeated for sure. Um, but they're, they're sort of generated by what's going on in the room. Yeah, and that's one thing I noticed, because like I said, I got to watch a lot of it. And I was, I was actually, having seen a lot of stand-up, I was shocked at how much of it was new like consistently how many new pieces I constantly saw because I don't think that's as normal you know no and a lot of guys by the way do the exact same thing every single night and do it brilliantly right people you know love it and look forward to hearing the exact same thing again and and so it's not sort of a a holier than now thing it's well for one thing I have no I have a very bad memory and so to sort of memorize anything is even like to do those stupid five minute things on uh, television. Uh -huh. um, you know, if you do the Tonight Show or something, they want you to do five minutes. And memorizing that is sheer agony to me. And it tends to sort of stifle me somehow so nervous about it. Right. I have a, I have a really big question very specifically for you. Uh, we, you know, in the, um, in the creative industry in general, one of the, the big pieces of advice you always hear about anybody who's like, what do I do to become more successful and to stand out um, no matter what it is that I'm doing. And one of the, the tenets that you hear is the adage, be yourself. You just hear that a lot. And yet I think there are a lot of up and coming um, artists who struggle with what the heck that means. Like be myself, uh, I'm me. But you, I think very much stand out as somebody who um, you seem to not only talk about yourself and your life often. You seem to um, do it in a way that very much reflects how you think and how you deliver. And, um, and actually the delivery style, the very kind of random, and I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna jump here, I'm gonna jump here. It seems to be, uh, you know, have served you extraordinarily well. Um, is that something that you always knew how to be you or did you have to learn that in some respects? A big element of all of what you just said is um, mental illness, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I have, uh, I have obsessive compulsive disorder, which by the way, everyone has. It's only diagnosed based on the degree to which it interrupts your life. Is that, is that a true, is that a fact? Yeah, huh. yeah, it is. Um, and and it's, it manifests itself in different ways in different people. Yeah. Uh, people think of it as the cleaning Jones or people who won't shake hands because of germs. That's, that's one aspect and, and someone may or may not have that part of it. For me, everything that gets said reminds me uh, of something that I feel that I must say. And it can be something that I said that, that reminds me, or it can be something somebody else said that reminds me. And for the longest time, oh, A, I didn't know what that was 
And so I never shut up. Um, but uh, B, I thought it was just this, this really awful characteristic in me. And socially, by the way, it is. Uh, nobody likes talking to me. But, um, uh, <laughs> or should I say listening? But in terms of stage, I think I finally, when I understood it a little bit, I think I finally just embraced it. And in fact, a big, a big breakthrough was writing the book that I wrote, which is called There's Nothing in This Book That I Meant to Say. Every chapter is a different, uh, is a different historic figure. Um, but every time I go to tell something about that historic figure, uh, I get distracted and I tell whatever thought I'm having. Usually autobiographical. It's usually something about me or something that it reminds me of. And so every chapter is, in fact, uh, an um, authentic, albeit brief, biography of this historic figure. But most of the book's about me. Right. And uh, I finally just decided to make that, you know, a good part of me, yeah, a, a fun part of me, instead of a, a part that was somehow burdensome. And uh, I think it's really, it's, it's improved my life on stage a lot. Yeah, on stage. You're, you're, yeah. Speci you're specifying that? My personal life is doomed. Tell me about Rhonda Puckett. You're uh, the, the, the woman you know who is a uh, incredible cook. Uh, as well as she's also has a good friend who's a photographer. She has a show called uh, Cooking with Rhonda, and uh, uh, she is. Uh, it's a show for the beginning cook, uh, the cook with no experience, the cook, the cook who fears that they won't be able to prepare the frozen lean cuisines. And uh, Rhonda takes them through it step by step. She's a giver. She's a giver. She, she is, she's a, she's a giver and, and, uh, and she makes no pretense. That's the great thing about Rhonda. You know, one of the things, mostly I hate stupid computers, but um, I, I must say that one of my guilty pleasures, uh, I do enjoy thinking of a silly, stupid idea and uh, filming it and putting it up. You're traveling mostly on weekends, right? In addition to the monthly NPR, wait, wait, don't tell me. The format of the show uh, allows for what you know what we were talking about earlier, which is uh, sp spontaneity. The host of the show, for people who don't know, it's a weekly news quiz show on NPR. And the host of the show, Peter Sagal, um, he obviously has a script so that he can ask the questions uh, and uh, and then tell the you know, tell the answers, explain the news stories and things. So he has a script, but the panelists are totally unscripted. And um, it's a blast. Uh, you know, it's like, I think it's like being a batter in a batting cage. You know, you just get lobbed yeah. these topics. And, you know, sometimes I just watch it go by, uh, but sometimes I get a little piece of it. Imagine like this moon-eyed 19-year-old um, about to go out into the big world of whatever the creative field is and says... Paula, give me three amazing pieces of advice of how to um, be happy in what I do long term. For me, it's a relationship with the audience. You know, I I'll be totally honest with you in a way that I probably shouldn't huh. be. You know, sometimes I look at other people's careers and I feel like, oh, how come I don't do that? Oh, how come I, you know, this person's, you know, yeah, got this thing or they have that, th they have this show or they, you, you know, every time I do that. I have to remind myself to sort of put my eye back on the ball and, 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 and be in my own game, you know, whatever that is. I, I'm not responsible for what job I get hired doing or for, uh, I'm only responsible for the work that I do. You know what I mean? Making sure that the work that I do is, is as good as I can make it and, uh, and that, you know, and that I'm in relationship um, with that audience, and they are my main, they are my main focus, you know? Well, actually, that's funny, too, because basically there were two things there. The one was that when you look at everybody else, it kind of drains your energy from what you're giving when you're in your element, right? Like, if you're saying, I could maybe do that or maybe do this, it takes away from what you're providing when you put all your energy here. I think it does. Yeah. I mean, I think it does. And, and I mean, I suppose it's like, it, it's like any other practice in life. You know, you're only, you know, it's like when you get upset with somebody else and blah, blah, blah. You know, you, you only got control of, uh, of yourself. It's just that, the other, and the other thing is that if I never had anything more than what I get right now in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of work, I remain the luckiest comic in the entire world because 
I've been working, uh, you know, 32 years at this job. And because I absolutely love the audiences that I work with. And this silly, stupid internet computery thing that came along ha- has, in fact, given me uh, um, additional connection to those people that I really, really enjoy. Uh, you know, I mean, the first time I ever saw Twitter, I thought it was the most egocentric, stupid thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I still think that. It's just that I enjoy it very much. <laughs> I do too. You said one of your children was uh, locked out somewhere and you had to go rescue her? I do. I do. She's, 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 she's pet sitting right now yes. uh, for a cat that won't let her in. <laughs> okay. Well, um, tell us. I know we can go to pa- paulapoundstone.com. And, um, Paula Poundstone. Yep. Yeah. And, and Twitter, you're Paula Poundstone. I am Paula Poundstone on Twitter. Yes. Yeah. I don't know who thought of that, but it's genius. And then Facebook or anything else? Any other ways that you'd want people to connect with you? I'm on Facebook. I I do all that goofy stuff. It's uh, it's amazing that one has time for anything else, actually. Thank you so much for making us laugh, Paula. Join us next time as we sit down with Doug Gordon, recently awarded the UN's Photography Leadership Council Award. While you're waiting for that, though, go ahead and just, like, Take your DSLR and strap it to your leg. That's right, the B-Grip Evo camera belt grip makes it possible to carry a heavy camera from your waist. Forget about being dragged down by those very average neck straps. The B-Grip has a comfortable belt that's secure and easy to use. Be the quickest on the draw too with its easy release base plate. You can find the B-Grip on adorama.com. Special thanks to our sponsors, Adorama, the photography people, and T1Line, the voice and data solution experts.